Hello, future nurses of America. How are you? Um, so I am going to be discussing legal and ethical issues related to psychiatric mental health. So I am going to share my screen right now. And this is the PowerPoint that I have uh, posted on Canvas. Um, you will have a question on your first learning experience um, when we meet the first day of class. So this is pre presented to the future nurses of America. And here we go. If my phone goes off, I apologize because I'm on call tonight at one of the um, health facilities as well. Okay. So your objectives for this is to define legal and ethical rights of mentally ill patients, um, laws for psychiatric patients, and your responsibilities, both ethical and legal, um, in regards to the role of a psychiatric nurse. Okay. They've already paged me. So sources of law, this goes back to um, your high school and college days. It's the constitution, state and federal statutes, um, other legal cases that the laws represented. And for us in healthcare, it's Joint Commission and Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And Centers for Medicaid and Medicaid Services, um, those are federal. And that's one of the reasons that you're fingerprinted um, when you're for our clinical, because we receive dollars from these institutions. Okay. So standards of care, um, they're put on by the American Nurses Association and the American Hospital Association. So. Um, the standards of care, they can differ from one community to another. And if your license is ever put on the line, they will call people within your community or within your specialty um, to discuss this. For example, I go to the BRN four times a year when other uh, nurse practitioners, um, both in psych and ER, are brought up on charges because those are my two specialties. So they will ask me, uh, questions such as, in this case, what would you have done or what were the standards of care? And just a little side note, when you go into to practice, when you are a nurse, you want to find out what the policies and procedures are in within your hospital and always follow them. So um, two institutions that I belong to are two uh, professional organizations are the American Psychiatric Nurse Association and then the International Society of Psychiatric Mental Health Nurses. I strongly urge you to join an organization now for a few reasons. Number one, as a student, they're either free or low cost. And number two, you'll be invited to programs. And what I tell people is that you want to find out who the hiring managers are, who the DONs are, and keep in touch with them. For example, if you're interested in, in psychiatric nursing, you, you know, finish my class, uh, you can let one of the DONs, hey, I just finished uh, my second um, semester in psych, now I'm going to my third semester, okay? Um, I finished my third semester, now I'm going to my fourth semester and graduated and so on. So keep them abreast of what you are doing. Keep your name out there. So negligence, think of negligence as malpractice as well. And four elements must be present for negligence, okay? The four are duty to care, obligations of reasonable care, breach of duty, and injury caused by breach of duty. So let's say you're an RN and you walk into a patient's room and it, it, it's the duty of care is there because here you are, Mr. Smith, with your ID on, you're an RN, so you've been trained at the minimal standards. Obligation of reasonable care. Okay, so you're the nurse assigned for this patient. And again, you are an RN and you have been trained. Breach of duty and injury caused by breach of duty need to be proved as well. So let's say, so you're a nurse and um, you're making rounds and one of the CNAs tells you that the patient in room 100's blood pressure is, you know, 210 over 110, okay? And you say, well, it's my break. I'm going to go on my break. I'll take care of him later. Well, you go on your break, you leave the floor, the patient has a heart attack and they die. Okay. So what will happen is they'll call for the chart. You know, you'll be brought up on charges. 
because was there duty of care? Yes, you're the RN. Was there obligation of reasonable care? Yes. Was there a breach of duty? Yes, there was a breach of duty because you did not follow your protocol for tra uh, treating a hypertensive patient. And was there injury caused by breach of duty? Yes, again, there was injury caused because the patient died. Okay, same scenario. Well, same patient. So let's say you're making your rounds and uh, the CNA reports to you that the patient's blood pressure is elevated. I forgot what I said, like 200 over 110. So you go and assess the patient and you give the patient some medication to bring his um, blood pressure down. However, he still strokes out and dies. Was there duty of care? Yes. Was there obligation of reasonable care? Yes. Was there breach of duty? No, because you were following the protocols and was there injury caused by breach of duty? No. So again, could you be sued? Yes. Would you be held liable? Most likely not. Would you have your license taken away? No, because you're follow, you follow the policy and procedures of your institution. Very, very, very important. So again, claims against nurses who, who fail to take measures to prevent harm to patients or fail to maintain the standard of care in the nurse community, you can be brought up on charges. The only time that you wanna get a letter from the BRN is when it says, hey, um, you can take the boards. Uh, two, you pass the boards. Three, it's time to renew your license, okay? Those are the only times. If you ever get a letter from them any other times, it's probably not a good letter. So again, you want to know your policies and procedures of what hospital you're at and who you can delegate um, uh, task to, and you have to know what their level of comp, uh, competence is. So when you're an RN, you're gonna be delegating things to LVNs, LPNs, mental health workers, CNAs, and so on, okay? So you wanna make sure that they have the training, okay? And then again, we all, even in my position, I have to follow policies and procedures, okay? Um, so uh, policies and procedures from one hospital might differ from another hospital. So wherever you go, you want to know. And again, if you don't feel comfortable carrying out a task, or if you weren't trained to carry out a task, then you need to let your supervisor know, okay? There's been times in my career where I refuse to do a task because I haven't been trained. Because my claim to fame is I know what I don't know. Never be afraid to ask because you guys, are working hard to through this program and you'll work, continue to work hard to, to get your license and to continue your edu education, you want to protect it. So determining negligence is the four things that I, I told you, and these are some more, okay? So again, the four need, duty to care, obligation of reasonable care, breach of duty, and injury caused. If they cannot be proved, um, then um, you're not going to be held liable. Can you be held in a lawsuit? Yes, because when families sue, they sue everybody that's named in that chart. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you some specific laws pertaining to mental health patients. Okay. The Terrasoft, you need to know this. Um, if you're working in a psychiatric facility and a patient um, they state that they're going to harm someone and they give a specific individual's name, you need to do the best of your ability to warn that person, okay? And I've had to do this through three, four times in my career where I, I call somebody and I let them know that someone has made a threat against their life. And two of the times that I've done this, they've, um, they've known who the patient is, okay? So you need to balance the duty to protect confidentiality with the responsibility to warn that person of potential danger, okay? And I have a lot of patients that come in and tell me that they're gonna kill the white guy down on Skid Road. Well, um, again, there's a lot of white guys down on Skid Road, so obviously I can't warn all of them. So they need to give you a specific name of an individual, okay? So again, mental health professionals have a duty to warn a third party of intended harm or possible danger. And this all came as a result um, when a person at the University of California, Irvine, um, did not take a patient's threat seriously, and the patient was released, and they went out and harmed an individual, okay? 
Um, again, on a side note, when anybody ever states that they want to harm the president of the United States, we actually have to warn, we have to call the Secret Service and the Secret Service will come down and they will interview the patient. Okay. False imprisonment. Okay. This is when you lock somebody in a room or you uh, refuse to let somebody leave. Okay. And it's intentional, unjustified, non-consensual detention. Okay. And I'll give you a simple case of this. Let's say um, we're in a classroom and our class ends at 12 and I lock the door and I do not let you leave. I could be held on false imprisonment. Okay. So if somebody is a voluntary admission into the hospital and you refuse to let them leave and they don't meet criteria to be in the hospital, um, then you, I, or whoever the person is, can be held liable. Uh, if somebody wants to leave AMA and you force them to stay, you can be held liable. And if you put somebody in mechanical and chemical restraints for no reason, that's false imprisonment as well. Okay, mechanical restraints are the leather restraints when you tie somebody down, and chemical restraints are the emergency medications. Okay, again, in order to put somebody in restraints, there needs to be justified reason. For example, they're threatening to kill themselves, or they're extremely hostile and fighting other people, threatening to kill them. And the same goes with chemical restraints. So patients must be treated in the least restrictive setting, okay? So in the psych realm, if they're placed on a 5150, which is um, the criteria is danger to self, danger to others, or greatly disabled, and they're in an inpatient setting, that's the least restrictive. We're moving more and more to outpatient treatment, okay? And again, when somebody is in the hospital, they need to be active participants. And I'm sure some of you have been hospitalized, not in a psychiatric setting, but maybe you've given birth, you've broken your leg or something. And I think that the worst thing about being hospitalized is when the nurses or the staff are not informing you of what's going on. So it's very important, you know, when you're dealing with your patients, when you become an RN, and when you're dealing with patients now as an RN student, that you inform the patient. It's very important you let them know what the plan is upon discharge. They have to be involved in it what medications they're taking, um, what the date is, you wanna orientate them to time because patients often lose track of time because they've been in the hospital, okay? So assault and battery, assault is non-consensual threat. Like if you yell at somebody saying, I'm gonna kill you, okay? You can be brought up on assault charges. Battery is actually touching them. So if you say, I'm gonna kill you and you grab them, you can be a hell for assault and battery, okay? And as nurses, we cannot threaten barley harm to somebody um, in order to get them to do something, okay? Uh, just because a patient is in a psychiatric um, hospital, they do have the right to refuse. They can even refuse medications unless they are reached, and I'll go over that more, okay? So you cannot lay hands on a patient, okay, without justification. Now, if a patient is attempting to leave and they are on a 5150 or a 5250 or temporary conservatorship or full conservatorship, you can stop them, okay? Or if a patient is going to hit you, you can place hands on them. And we actually have a program, and if I can get enough volunteers to come in on a Saturday, um, we have a, 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 a mental health worker that teaches um, how to defend yourself against psychiatric uh, patients, okay? Any questions, okay? This would be the time in the lecture I would stop and I'd ask you some questions about 5150s, 5250, what constitutes assault and battery, what are policy procedures and why are those important, and what are the four criteria that be brought up on charges? Think of all those, you might see them somewhere else, okay? So advanced directive for healthcare, these came out in 1991, okay? You have a right if you're 18 or older to choose what type of medical treatment you wanna receive, okay? I have this clearly written down for myself. If two physicians telling are telling my family that I'm not coming back, then you can pull the plug, okay? What I see a lot of times, especially with younger people who get in car accidents, um, the family is too devastated and they feel guilty and they wanna keep their loved ones on life support. And I've seen people on life support for many, many, many years. So 
all of you guys should have living wills and healthcare directives, naming somebody um, to make decisions for you when you can, and durable power of attorney. And there's two types of durable power of attorney. One's durable uh, power of attorney for healthcare, and the other one's is durable power of attorney for finances. Really, unless you're married, they shouldn't be the same, okay? And again, when you cannot make decisions on your own, this person steps in and makes them for you. So voluntary admission is a patient comes in and states that they need to come to the hospital. And at our facility, I, we don't admit voluntary. Um, normally voluntary admissions or voluntaries can be handled at home. There's a lot of facilities that do let patients come in on a voluntary basis and they consent to their treatment. We do have people after a 30 day hold is expired and they um, have nowhere to go. We will have them sign balls uh, so they can continue treatment until we can get them placed. One thing that Exodus does not do, we do not discharge to the street. We always give the patient the opportunity to accept all the programs that we have to offer. Okay. So here we go. So criteria for a 5150, a 5150 is a 72 hour hold. And criteria that must be present is danger to self, danger to others, or gravely disabled as a result of a mental illness, okay? Danger to self, patient states, hey, I'm hearing voices telling me to kill myself and I'm going to kill myself. Danger to others, patient might say I'm hearing voices to kill you, okay? And that's why it's always important when you're talking to your patients um, and you wanna ask them what if they're hearing voices, if they state yes, you wanna know what those voices are telling them. Because for me, if a patient, if a patient states they're hearing voices to, to kill the short bald guy in front of them, I wanna know because I need to maintain my safety. And again, when you're interviewing patients, you always want your back to the wall or closest to the door and you always want to be about six feet away from them, not just for COVID, but for the fact if they go to strike out, they can't hit you. Last criteria is gravely disabled, and this is unable to provide food, shelter, and clothing, or a plan for self-care. And a lot of students will ask me, then why aren't all homeless people placed on a hold for being gravely disabled? Well, if they can tell you, they might tell you, I sleep under the bridge, I get my food from the garbage can. Okay. Um, and I get my clothes from the garbage can. That might not be how me or you access our clothing, but that is what they do. I've gone to multi million dollar homes and I've placed people on holes for really disabled because I'll go into their refrigerator and all the food will be rotten. And they'll tell me the reason that they're not eating their food is because the devil's telling them not to. So, criteria for 5150 is danger to self danger to others, or gravely disabled. It can be all three, it can be just one of those, but it has to be one. And again, this is a piece of paper that's in the chart, and this is good for 72 hours, three days, okay? Competency happens when it's legal determination that an adult patient cannot care for themselves, and they're placed on a conservatorship. I'm sure you've all heard about the conservatorship of um, Britney Spears. She was on a conservatorship for many years. And just because you're not on, just because you're on a conservatorship does not mean that you need to stay in the hospital. A lot of people do. And right now we have six or seven patients on the unit that are actually on a conservatorship. And a conservatorship is for one year, okay? So the court will appoint a guardian to make decisions on the patient's behalf. And there's two types of conservators. One is a person that you choose who's 18 or older, so it can be a family member. The other is a public guardian, and the public guardian is a employee of the county, okay? So there's pros and cons of both. Having a family member, you hope that, they're best, that they have your best interest in mind. Okay, but I've seen a lot of families really torn apart by um, having their mom or dad or brother or sister as a as the conservator because a conservator can sign you into the hospital. For example, if you're not taking your medications, they can sign you in. You still need criteria to come in. They just can't drop you off and say, "Hey, babysit him for the weekend." It doesn't work that way. They still you still need to meet criteria. 
Um, but just think of being conservatorship as being um, 17 years old again, somebody else is making your decisions, okay? And the biggest thing again, is that um, as a conservator, you want to make sure that the conservatee, the patient is included in, in, in the healthcare because nobody ever wants to go into their healthcare blind, okay? Informed consent, this is when patients have the right to be given enough information to make a decision. So whenever I'm dealing with a patient and I'm talking about medications, I always explain risk, benefits, and side effects of medications, okay? And they need to sign the medication consent. But if a patient is on um, conservatorship, the conservator is the one that needs to sign the medication consent, okay? Uh, we can actually give medication in an emergency situation, okay? As long as it is justified in a chart of why we're giving it, okay? Like we'll have patients come in that are florally psychotic, hearing voices, threatening to kill staff, not, um, not taking a uh, directive, not um, just totally going off. And when we try to de-escalate them, bring them down, uh, they do not respond. So sometimes they have to be placed in restraints and given emergency medication. Again, as long as it's documented, it can be done. Okay. So when you're advocating for your patient, you wanna make sure that they have enough knowledge um, information about why they're being admitted and what medications they're being given. Are they competent? Um, do they know what's going on? Okay. And are they doing it out of their own free will? Okay. Free of pressure or coercion. So you'll be asked many times in your role as an RN to sign off when a doctor or a nurse practitioner um, is explaining a procedure that's going to be done. Okay. And um, you're just there signing as witness that you believe that the, pa uh, that the patient can make their own decisions, okay? Very, very important, okay? Confidentiality, um, again, we can't share information with anybody. Um, if somebody's in a psychiatric hospital, a chemical dependency unit, or they have HIV, that's when confidentiality is high, okay? So let's say somebody calls a unit and they ask if John Doe is there. I always tell, and I'll look in the chart, and if the patient hasn't signed any release of information, I will let the caller know, and I'll state this, that I cannot confirm or deny that the patient is in the hospital, okay? Um, but I will let them know, um, I, how should I put this? I will go back and tell the patient that so and so called, and if that patient makes the decision to call that patient back or to call that person back, then obviously that person knows that the patient's in the hospital. Okay, and it's very, very, very. You can be brought up on charges if you do not keep information confidential. Okay, it's the HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Okay, and again, it's to protect the patient. Protect the patient. When you guys become nurses, what you might want to do is just have one family member be spokesperson and give that family member a, a code word. Like when my mom was in the hospital, the code word was teddy bear. So when I called, I gave the nurse the word teddy bear so she knew that I, um, she could provide information, he or she could provide information to me. And again, you won't be tested on this next statement, but to save yourself some time and some agony because you'll be working very hard as nurses, only speak to one person or one family member, let them be the spokesperson because you're not gonna have time all day to um, field phone calls. So rights um, for mental health patients, they have treatment in the least restrictive setting. However, if they're on a hold, least restrictive would be inpatient, okay? They have the right to refuse treatment, okay? Uh, they have the right to review medical records. They have the right to refuse medication unless they have been reesed, R-E-I-S-E-D. And what reese is, is if a patient refuses medication and the psychiatrist and only the psychiatrist deems that the medication is necessary, the psychiatrist can actually fill out paper and the patient will go to court and now court's done Zoom and the psychiatrist will state 
why he believes, he or she believes that the patient needs the medication and actually it will go in front of a judge. And the judge will hear from the patient and the judge will hear from the psychiatrist and make a decision. I've never seen in my career a patient win a researing. And what happens is when the patient loses the researing, they go back to the floor, back to the unit, they are offered the medication. If they refuse, they can get the medication IM through an injection. And normally what happens is after two or three days of getting IMs, the patient is doing better, is more clearer, and will accept the oral pills, okay? The Reese, and this is very important to know, is only good for as long as the hold, okay? So a 5150 is good for three days or 72 hours. A 5250 is good for 14 days, okay? And the criteria for a 5150 and a 5250 are the same, danger to self, danger to others, or greatly disabled. A TCON, temporary conservatorship, or a 30-day hold is good for 30 days. And a TCON, the only criteria is gravely disabled, okay? And full conservatorship is good for one year, okay? So again, we never initiate a RES during this uh, 5150. We normally start them on the 5250, and it expires when someone is placed on a 30-day hold. And if the patient, at when they're placed on a 30-day hold, re, could start to refuse medication again, we'll, we'll call for another resharing. Patient has the right to wear their own clothes and keep their own possessions. Uh, we can do what's called denial of rights as well. Let's say a patient is trying to escape or are AWOL. We can take their clothes from them, but we have to inform the state of why we're doing so. Okay. They can have access to storage space to see visitors each day unless it's contraindicated in their care. We had um, um, a visitor come one day and that person actually brought drugs in for his girlfriend. So we didn't allow that patient to have visitors anymore. Or let's say the patient's hospitalized on a 5150 or 5250 for danger to others because they threatened their mother, then probably having their mother to come and see them is not a good thing, okay? They have access to a telephone. Um, and they need privacy when they're on the phone. However, we've had some patients call 911 asking for an ambulance to get out of there so we can have it so they can't make phone calls. Access to letters and stamps, uh, refuse shock treatment, electroconvulsive therapy, and we'll speak about that when we talk about mood uh, disorders. They can refuse psychosurgery. Back in the day, uh, patients used to be admitted to state hospitals and they'd actually take out half their brain. That can't happen anymore. And they have a right to speak with a patient's right advocate. So when somebody's placed on a uh, 5150, 5250 TCON, um, before they go to court, uh, a patient's advocate will come and speak to them and talk to them about what they want. Any questions? So denial of rights, they're ordered by the physician or MP. Uh, we give denial of rights when it's contraindicated for treatment. Um, the examples I was giving was, for example, the patient, um, we went to a denial, denial of rights not to allow visitors on the unit because patient threatened to kill them. Or if patient tried to escape, we will do denial of rights so they can't wear their own clothes. And these are reported monthly to the state. And if you have a lot of denial of rights or if you have a lot of seclusions, you place patients in restraints, both uh, chemical and mechanical, then the state will come down and say, hey, what are you doing? The goal is not to have to put somebody in seclusion, not to have to put somebody in leather restraints, not to have to give emergency medications, okay? And again, if you have too many, the patient's rights um, board will come down and say, hey, what's going on? Okay, seclusion restraints, Okay, you want to keep the unit safe. Okay, and sometimes one patient can really disrupt the unit. So if you have a patient that's threat threatening to staff and other patients, you want to try to de-escalate, but sometimes the escalation doesn't work. Okay, so seclusion and restraints are the last resort. Okay, the last resort. You want to do everything in your power to try to de-escalate the situation. And honestly, at Exodus, we don't have a lot of seclusion and restraints. 
So you want to think to yourself, what are some nursing strategies for alternatives to seclusion and restraints? Uh, talking to patients, playing cards with patients. Um, I hate when I get a call at two o'clock in the morning and the nurse on the other end says, the patient's at the nurse's station. Can I give him, can I put him in restraints because I don't want him at the nurse's station? Well, talk to the patient. And I always say, I always say, you'd be surprised what you will learn when you actually talk to a patient. Okay. So some um, examples of seclusion, placing a patient in a locked room, you can't do that, okay? Um, holding a pa closing the door and holding the patient in there, okay? Um, exiting a patient from a group, okay? Um, I've seen patients in wheelchairs where they'll put a food tray in front of them so they can't get out. I was shocked I walked into one nursing home in the wheelchairs were um, pulled backwards so the handles were on the sidewall and the so the patients couldn't roll away those are all unnecessary seclusion um i know a nurse that lost her nursing license because she was working night shift and when she came in she would lock all the patients in their rooms so she would not be bothered so restraints are the responsibility of the nurse the registered nurse okay so in an emergency situation, a nurse can put a patient in restraints, but then she needs to call the on-call provider, okay? You have to obtain an order within one hour, but check um, the policy and procedure of your hospital, okay? When patients are in restraints at Exodus, they have to be on a one-to-one, -one, okay? And um, restraints are all or nothing. So if you decide to take a patient out of the restraints, it's all the restraints. Um, back in the day, we used to take out like one arm, one leg, or vice versa. But what would happen a lot of times is when the patient had that one arm free, they would try to injure themselves or try to pull the other restraints off. And I've seen people break their um, their arm. Okay. Um, normally, when a patient is placed in restraints, we notify the family to let them know why. And you want to do that because what you don't want to see is when a family member comes in and the patient says, hey, I was in restraints, and then the families tend to freak out. And the maximum time frames, you won't be tested on that, but there are time frame frames. You can't just keep somebody in restraints indefinitely. So the reason that we have all these laws, the Latterman Petrus Short uh, Act, the LPS, is back in the day, you could drop somebody off at a psychiatric facility and they could live there for years and years and years and years, okay? Now in California, um, the LPS, um, it shows what laws and what uh, directives we can do when somebody is involuntary admitted into a hospital, okay? So I'm gonna review these again. So a 5150 is a 72-hour hold, danger to self, danger to others, or gravely disabled. It can be one of them, all of them, okay? But it has to be at least one. 5250, let's say the patient isn't gonna be better and their three-day hold is up, you place them on a 14-day hold, okay? Criteria for a 14-day hold is the same, danger to self, danger to others, or gravely disabled. So somebody's in there for a total of 17 days and they still need treatment, they're still endorsing suicidality, they still can't care them for themselves. They're placed on a 5352, which is also known as a TCON, and that is a 30-day hold, okay? Um, again, what is the name of the hearing that a psychiatrist can only order when somebody is refusing their medication? That would be a reese hearing, okay? So I'm going to stop there and just explain a few more things. So when somebody is placed on a 5250, they have a right for what's called a PCH, a probable cause hearing, okay? And a PCH is done um, in front of a judge, okay? Now it's done via Zoom, where the patient will state their case, why they feel that they can be released, okay? And how I remember a PCH, a probable cause hearing is Pacific Coast Highway, okay? And the probable cause hearing is done again um, on site. 
So the social worker on duty, she'll re represent the psychiatrist. The patient is represented by themselves and by the patient care advocate, okay? So I've seen some patients win their PCH and if they win their PCH, they're released. If they lose their back, they go back to the unit, okay? Um, and the patient can invite anybody that they want to come to the PCH that they want. And you as students will have an opportunity to see some probable cause hearings, okay? Your job during the probable cause hearing is just to sit there and not say anything, okay? Just observation. Criteria for a 30-day hold is gravely disabled only, okay? Um, if somebody's placed on a conservatorship, it's good for a year. And then every year after that, they go back to court, okay? So again, 5150, danger to yourself, danger to others, gravely disabled. 5250, danger to self, danger to others, or gravely disabled. It can be one of them, two of them, or all of them, but it has to be at least one. For a 30-day hold, a temporary conservatorship, it is only gravely disabled, okay? And when somebody's placed on conservatorship, what are the two types of conservators? The public guardian, which is a county employee, or a private conservator, which can be anybody over the age of 18. So again, uh, PCH is certification and review hearing. It's done on the unit. Now, if somebody loses their probable cause hearing, they can request what's called a writ of habeas corpus. It's a second opinion and normally done off the unit, okay? So let's say you're a patient, you were placed on a 5250, uh, you had your probable cause hearing and you lost, you can ask for a second opinion, okay? A re-hearing, remember, it is when you're refusing medications and the judge mandates medication administration. Um, the re-hearing can only be asked for by the psychiatrist. And the terrorist off advisement, what is that? When patient makes uh, threats against a specific individual, you need to warn that person. Okay. So again, your role is to advocate for a therapeutic environment, Milro, to keep everything calm, okay? And you wanna provide patients and families um, all the information that they need. One thing I like about working weekends is I like calling families in to educate them on the process. And you wanna make sure the family's on board because I've seen this happen a lot of times where you'll get a patient in the hospital, you'll get them stable, you send them home and the family doesn't agree with the medication, the patient stops the medication and they end up back in the hospital, okay? And you always wanna give treatment options, okay? And try to build the patient up, okay? Um, because again, when you're in the hospital, you lose track of time, you might lose your job. If you're going to school, you're not going to school anymore, you might be failing out of that. So our goal is to get the patient back to the appropriate level where they can integrate back into society. Okay. So there's some common sources of liability in um, the psychiatric uh, arena. Um, if a patient commits suicide, um, that's why we have Q10 minute checks. They're improper treatment. There's been um, allegations that, you know, staff in various hospitals have had sex with patients or have beaten patients. Misuse of psychotropic, uh, psychotropic medications. There has to be an indication why a patient is on medication. Breach of confident, uh, confidentiality. Um, there's been issues where uh, nurses or staff have told other people about people they've taken care of and it's gotten back to that person. I've seen this big time with celebrities. False imprisonment and what keeps us free from false imprisonment is if a patient is on a hold, and they attempt to leave, we can keep them back. But if somebody's voluntary and we block, their, block them and they don't meet criteria, we can be held up on false imprisonment charges. Uh, injuries or problems related to ECT. Um, we'll talk about ECT when we talk about mood disorders. Sexual contact with client, yes, it does happen. Failure to obtain informed consent, that happens. Uh, failure to report abuse. And again, even as a student, you're a mandated reporter and the terrorist off failure to warn potential victims. Okay. Any questions? Again, you want to know the laws. You want to follow the policies and procedures of your facility. 
It is very, very important. If you follow your policies and procedures, um, can you be sued? Yes. Will you be uh, convicted or will you lose your suit? Most likely no, as long as you follow your policies and procedures. And one thing that I see a lot with new grads is they'll go into the hospital and their boss will want to float them to a different unit. If you have not been trained in that unit, it's very, very, very important that you state no. You need training before you go to specialized units. Any questions, email me, call me. I am looking forward to this semester and sharing my passion for psychiatric mental health nursing. Have a good night.